First thing, thank you for taking of your time uh, to talk about your movie. I absolutely loved it. I was so completely blown away with what I saw. I wasn't <laughs> expecting anything. So thank you. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> we had a lot. We have a lot to talk about. I don't know. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to cram this in 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll, try, my best. I'll try my best. Um, I, sure. What, yeah, what as much time as you want. I'm <laughs> what motivated you do, to talk about this event in this way because i know crime drama people are gonna love it and and you know crime junkies are gonna love it and and and, and, and you know uh those uh conspiracies and uh, uh, so the <laughs> they're all just gonna eat it up because it's something we live for but what 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 how did you did you wake up one day it's like i'm gonna do this but how did this happen <laughs> well, I've been thinking about Watergate for a long time and, and, and have written about it a little bit in, in other media, but, um, and I'd worked in Washington. I was a Senate speechwriter for a couple of years before I went to film school. And, and so I kind of really love and appreciate that culture of Washington and leaking and the press and working in government. Um, and I'd known a couple of people kind of tangentially involved with Watergate over the years. Um, but it really kind of precipitated because the last film I did, which was called Bernard and Huey, the last day of shooting, that was um, was the day of the presidential election in, in 2016 where Trump got elected. And that day I was showing dailies to my writer on that film, was a guy named uh, Jules Pfeiffer, who um, – who has a was a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist for the Village Voice, largely for his cartoons about Nixon and Watergate. So the conversation inevitably <laughs> went to, you know, well, we survived Watergate. What could possibly go wrong in the next four years? Um, and then that night, uh, I because Pfeiffer uh, lived in uh, Shelter Island, which is the tip of Long Island um, out near the Hamptons, and I took the ferry that night over to my friend uh, Terry owns this motel called the Silver Sands Motel in which is actually in Greenport, New York. Um, and, um, and his grandparents had built this place in the 50s and 60s and Terry had been running it for a couple of years and, and used it as a great location for fashion shoots. A lot of high end like mm -hmm. Vogue and Harper's fashion shoots shot there. But he said, no one's ever shot a feature and we're closed in the winter. And if you want to, um, you know, if you come up with something, uh, you know, we can all stay out here and shoot it. And, um, and, and he was with me talking to Pfeiffer. So we kind of had Watergate on the brain. It's like, okay, well, how can we do a Watergate film, which, you know, the Watergate story takes place in, in DC in, in a seaside resort. So that took a few months to figure out. And then I, I got together with my screenwriting friend, Daniel Moya, and we, um, and we, and, and once we did start doing the research and realized that there were these, um, multiple taping stations in in the white house complex different rooms had this voice activated taping system that nixon had put in and there really are tapes of nixon listening to other tapes and fumbling around with the buttons and once i realized that those really do exist then it became sort of plausible that we could have the story that we have where with a um, you know where connie willa fitzgerald's character is a is a white house um, mm -hmm. you know, transcriber who gets a hold of a tape of the tape of the missing 18 half minute gap, and then would naturally, naturally in our plot would meet a reporter at a seaside motel. Uh, we changed it to Maryland. It'll be a little closer to DC. And, um, and, and they, of course, they run afoul of, of, of hippie swingers and nefarious forces out to get them. Um, no, I mean, I absolutely love that. And I think it's nothing from this movie screams indie, nothing, everything about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the production value, I'm, I'm not joking, this is not a joke, I'm not, it's, this is that serious, it's nothing, everything on the movie, the production value movie, I mean, we, you guys put a lot of effort into it. You can see it from beginning to end, from the photography, from the uh, production design, and makeup, hairstyling, you went all out, in recreating those times with a, I'm assuming a really small budget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, or maybe an unexistent budget. You don't have to even tell me if you want. Yeah. <laughs> but to, from, an, from an unexistent to a small budget and an amazing cast, how, yeah. how in the hell were you able to put all of this together? Did, did, did you made a pack with the devil or something? Did you, <laughs> did you, you, know, you have some uh, mafia going around? 
what <laughs> I mean, I don't, you don't have to you don't have to say anything you know what i've got to but i'm 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 because I, I, the thing is i've recently i've been watching i've been seeing had the opportunity to review a bunch of independent movies aside from maybe hollywood triple i movies obviously but it's just independent scene has grown so much i mean we, we are seeing a bunch of independent movies just with the production value being so good how how were you able to make sure everything worked <laughs> well and to do it in the middle of a global pandemic too exactly um <laughs> Well, it, you know, then we just got a lot of it as luck and, and a community. I mean, this this whole thing started with crowdfunding, you know, as as most indie films do these days. Um, but we just, you know, but I've been doing, I've been, you know, this is like my sixth film, so I've been doing um, a, a lot of uh, of indie films over the years, and I've had a great cast. I, I worked with Richard Kind. Um, he was in my last film. Uh, so, you know, I knew we could probably get him if he's available. He's always very busy, and he was, so we were lucky. Um, Bruce Campbell, someone that I tried to work with on the last film, but the schedule didn't work. So he was a little familiar with me, so it wasn't crazy to, to reach out to him again. And honestly, it was, it was, it was an easy commitment to get someone like Bruce Campbell or John Cryer or Ted Ramey to do the 18 and a half and a cap. Bruce plays Richard Nixon, the voice mm -hmm. of Nixon, because for them as busy working actors, it was a fairly easy commitment. Oh, a couple hours voiceover in, you know, two years. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. You know? And then little did they know that, you know, I would call them in, in June of 2020 and say, by the way, we shot 11 days of the film had to take a, a pause for the pandemic mm -hmm. you guys are all sitting at home alone we're now going to do this over zoom mm -hmm. and that actually made it even easier for them because it was at a time when no actors were working no directors were working but you know because it was essentially like a little radio play within the film mm -hmm. we could do it over zoom and, and do it well and and it was a it was a lot of fun for all of them um, and then some of the other actors just came on board, like with 36 hours notice, Vondi Curtis Hall, like, you know, this amazing Emmy winning actor. He was like, yeah, I live in New York. I'll come out there. <laughs> See you in two days, you know? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and then there were people like Willa Fitzgerald, who wasn't particularly famous when we first met with her. And then after doing the film, she did uh, the series Reacher and mm -hmm. and you know kind of shot up her, her hollywood star kind of shot up but and then and then but she had been recommended by a director friend of mine uh lucky mckee uh, john mcgarrow was recommended by kelly reichardt uh from doing first cow so part of it is is that i know a lot of other directors who then you know they're always very generous with you with each other all of us are when recommending actors mm -hmm. i'm glad you mentioned bruce because i i mean the voice is the voice obviously and I wonder, and obviously we're all, but I want to talk about Bruce first. What, what was his reaction when you explained to him the story and when you're, he's going to do? Um, was he surprised? Was like, and seriously, <laughs> we're going that direction. What, that's what you want me to do? You want me to yeah. represent that guy? <laughs> what yeah. was his reaction? Well, for him, it was it was a it was a fun change from doing you know the genre films, Evil Dead kind of things, and and he had actually just done he had just played Reagan, Ronald Reagan, on an episode of Fargo, and had gotten a lot of critical attention for that, and I knew about that, and so this was kind of a nice you know hey let's do another crazy president you know, <laughs> and um, but he it turned out and I didn't know this until we started talking that he was a he had been obsessed with Watergate when he was a kid because, uh, you know, the TV was just preempted with all the Senate uh, Watergate hearings. And, and Bruce, who's a couple of years older than me, had really, you know, been obsessed with Watergate as a kid. And, and it turned out that he and Ted Ramey had actually done some comedy bits for an album with Nixon and Haldeman with actually Ted playing Nixon and, and Bruce playing the assistant, you know? And so they, so both of them were really familiar with Watergate and Nixon and, and were excited to, to do it. And what about Wella? And she did great. I mean, she did yeah. amazing. Oh my gosh. She yeah. carried that, that film. And, and, and the, uh, I mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit later about that, the third act, because I knew where we were going, but I wasn't expecting it to be that physical. Uh, um, and what you made those guys do. I mean, I'm pretty sure yeah. both, a lot of them just like, hey, I have Bruce as all my, so, you know, I, I want to talk about her. What was her reaction when, 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 when we, when, you know, did the approach 
and what she was doing and and everything about the story what was she like i mean okay. i i think her you know she really liked it um not just for the you know the the watergate side of it which is really just kind of a side thing it's really a, a her story it's a, it's mm -hmm. a story of, of this character from the early 70s and i think what she really saw in it and, and we talked about a lot was kind of where were women in the workplace in 1974 kind of with with that round of feminism and and especially working in washington as a civil servant you could only um sorry uh you could only go um sorry i just got a call right. um you could you could only go so far in 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 washington before you hit the glass ceiling not only as a woman but just as a as a civil servant because then it's all political appointees above that and so kind of exploring the culture of that but also we played ar around a lot with the specifics of 1974 how it was the tail end of the vietnam war and what were the ramifications for for all kinds of people at that age uh, or at that time but it was but it was 70s but it was pre-disco it was the end of the hippie era that had kind of faded by then so um so we kind of exp but there was still the the world war ii generation were only middle class at that were middle aged at that point so what were they doing and how did they interact with the with the youth culture of that time so it was a lot of those cultural things that that, that willa really saw in the film and and, and took to heart and, and did an amazing job bringing out in her performance and i absolutely saw it also and i i'm glad you mentioned it because you feel it i mean you, you see it and we see the difference from them to that today uh, on the film and I really do enjoy that one a lot. I want to talk about the last act without getting into too much details. I think the story plays out perfectly through that last act. I think a lot of people you. you know may expect where the story is going but may get blown away with how <laughs> how you wanted to end this. And I love I actually love how the beginning at the end connected. It was just it's just something yeah. amazing. So thank you. Props Thanks. to you for that one because I also saw that one was coming. But without giving too much away, it's difficult, I know. But um, <laughs> did you give them a head warning? You know, hey, this is gonna happen. We're gonna do this this way because we have four, we have four amazing actors in here, four veteran, mm -hmm. you know, awesome actors in here working, and basically they're butting heads. <laughs> they're going head to head. Uh, uh, in a physical scene, uh, was that written like that way in the beginning, or did you were like, well, maybe put let me put, yeah bring, let me <laughs> let me start it up not 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 here and let's get a little more physical. How did that last act came about? It was always scripted. It was um, and it was actually one of the first ideas that we had was um, thinking about number one, <laughs> what is the least romantic tape that a couple could be making love to while it's playing and it was the Nixon tape with again without giving too much away and then also then the flip side of that is what is the you know what is the most physical you know conflagration you could have again while this tape that is that is the tape that they've all been talking about mm -hmm. that that they've imparted so much import into and and the fate of the world relies on this tape and yet by the end of it, all this other stuff is going on and it's the audience that's listening to the tape, but not the characters. It's kind of the opposite of, of the MacGuffin that, that Hitchcock used to talk about. Um, so yeah, so that it was always in the script and, and part of it was also playing with the idea that, that as long as the tape is playing, we're kind of in a continuous shot. And um, and that was something that we 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 came close to close to pulling off, not quite, but close. And um, and that was you know and that just adds to the tension. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, hopefully it does. Um, but uh, you know, all the actors were great. I mean, they've all done a lot of physical, you know, fight scenes and action scenes and dancing scenes, you know, and uh, as well. Um, and, and and that was the thing is we also kind of want to reflect the we shot it in a similar style to the dancing scene earlier mm -hmm. you know so there's some parallels there but um again I, I hope we're not giving too much away but um but the um and we had a great stunt coordinator too my friend chris duke so you know we did it safely but that was literally all that stuff happened on the night that we shut down for covid so we and not everyone on the 
crew or cast knew that we were, we didn't even know it that when we started shooting that day, that we were going to end it that day. But yeah, we had, that was our 11th day. And we had just found out that we were the last feature film shooting in North America. Uh, there may, they, I think they said there was one other shooting in Puerto Rico actually, but, um, but it, we realized, yeah, we, everyone else must know something that we don't know. So we shut down for six months and then came back and did, and did another four days uh, in September of 2020. That was awesome. And then, I mean, I absolutely, that third act completely, like I said, <laughs> ended, the way the ends connect to the, and I, I'm, I'm not giving it any away here, but the way, and people gotta be aware of what, you know, keep the eye what you're seeing, because the way it ends, the way it begins, how it connects, Wow, what you did, uh, Dan. Maybe for people, last pitch, maybe for people that are not absolutely sure, they haven't seen it, they want to go see it. Uh, why, why should they go see the movie? Um, it, you know, it's it's fun. It's a, it's a like, well, I mean, you've been saying such lovely things about it, so it must be true. Uh, but it's a thriller, it's a comedy. Um, but also, I think the interesting thing is that by doing a period movie about Watergate, it, it's a way for people to reflect on whatever is happening now or in recent history. Um, you know, when we, we've shown it at festivals around the world and in Brazil, people are like, oh, this is really about Bolsonaro or or in, in England, they're like, oh, this is just like Boris Johnson scandal now. The connection, you know? yeah. The connection, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you, you know, look, you, I mean, it's e easy enough to read Trump into it, but if you want, you could read <laughs> Biden into it, you know, as long as you're watching the movie, that's all we care about. So, um, but I think that's a nice thing about doing a period film is it allow it, 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 it hopefully is relevant and, and will resonate, you know, with, um, you know, with audiences wherever they are. And, uh, you know, and then, we, and then we have a great soundtrack, which also just went on sale, too. <laughs> so. It does. I mean, the soundtrack really plays Thank into you. the story. I mean, the, into the theme. That's what I like. Like, mm -hmm. what, done, mm -hmm. was he, he really went into trying to recreate the theme and the times. And he really did. Even the photography. The photography. Wow. Just yeah. moving away also. Yeah. How you were able to create, recreate those themes. Dan, I want, don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to see the movie, no, to thank talk you, about it, and to talk <laughs> with you about it. Uh, it was, I, I mean, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, and I uh, hope you enjoy. everyone else enjoys the film as much as you did. <laughs> thank you.